Welcome to the Catholic Cafe, where Catholic truth is served fresh daily. We've made you a reservation in the luxurious corner booth, so come on in and see what's on the menu today. Now, here's your host, Deacon Jeff Drzezemski. Greetings and welcome to the Catholic Cafe. I'm Deacon Jeff, sitting in the luxurious corner booth of the Catholic Cafe. And of course, I have... Sam Rodriguez. That's me. Yeah, so I don't want to say, I'm going to say Ziggy. That, that is your nickname. Yes. But we had an email from a lady, <laughs> thank you, Peggy, who said, I heard this guest name at the beginning, something Stardust? <laughs> Mr. Stardust. Mr. Stardust. <laughs> Hi, Peggy, thanks for your email. Uh, it is Sam Rodriguez. Sam so he Rodriguez. Used his real, yes. his, his real name today, just uh, for your benefit and for all those who are like, who is this guy? Anyway, yeah. uh, that's a longer story. Well, if you want to use my, uh, my, my, my full, it's Captain Stardust. Captain Stardust, know? yeah. That's going to get you far. <laughs> and of course, we have, uh, I think Venerable Tom is a better nickname. Thank you. Because uh, you're on your way to heaven yes. right there. Yeah, that's you're the on, on the way to sainthood. Yes. Uh, we're all on the way to sainthood. Yes, we Some are. are further away than others, but Venerable is, uh, that's one of the. Yeah. One of the steps. I don't know so, if Captain is better than Venerable, Cap- or Venerable <laughs> no, is better than I'm gonna Captain. Go with, I'm going to go with Venerable. Are you? Yeah, okay. I'm going to go with Venerable. Because I was hoping I might be become a Captain. <laughs> yeah. Captain Venerable. But I guess he needs I don't to know. hope he becomes Venerable. Well, you know, well, you know Tom, I think you should be a Major. Yes. Major, major Tom. Tom. Ground control. <laughs> there we go. Man, these Ziggy Stardust references are going, <laughs> they're going way too far. So uh, we are going to talk today about, uh, I think that uh, this is an issue that's near and dear to most people now. It didn't used to always be this way, but I think it is. Uh, And and the experience I've had is uh, like when I'm preaching or teaching, I'm talking to a group of people, and and I'm usually preaching or teaching to the choir, right? They're there either at Holy Mass or they are in the church uh, gathered together to hear a talk on such and such. Uh, so they're they're kind of already in the club, as it were, right? And but when I start to say talk about things like, uh, you know, kids that don't want to go to mass anymore, and even further, kids that have left the church, using that phrase, kids who have left the church, it's incredible to me to to watch and maybe to sort of perceive the the pain of loss, the 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 confusion, the uh, bitterness, the sadness, all those different feelings. In the people and how I can actually see them kind of lean forward as if I'm going to give them something that's like, finally, we're going to get the answer how to get my kids back into the church or my friend, my, uh, you know, uh, maybe they're estranged from their spouse, you know, their, or their, uh, their, their parents or their aunt, uncle, whoever, it's like family members, uh, people that they know and people that they love have left the church. And this is becoming increasingly uh, more likely to happen. Uh, and and more prevalent in the in the world. And having just done a show uh, last week, and, and we did a, a show about the Catholic Church um, in a uh, pagan world. You know, we talked about that new polity show that we listened to uh, podcast, and it's like I we just wanted to kind of do a round two. Yeah, because there's just there really is a problem, and I think that problem at its root uh, philosophically becomes atheism. Or uh, disinterestedism. I don't know what you call it, uh, but you know, maybe not dealing with things so philosophically. But there's a real problem out there with people who don't go to church because yes. they don't believe in God because they're not. Um, I don't. They don't see it as, as relevant. Uh, you know, sometimes you. I remember being young and dumb, right? I, I just remember making mistakes when I was younger because I thought I was going to live forever, right? And now when I say young and dumb, it's it's kind of sad because. There are people, those same mistakes, they're making eternal mistakes, you know, I think. Stephen Wright said, I want to live forever. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is a, a poet who didn't know it. He, he definitely is a philosopher of our time. Uh, I, I, so I, I kind of wanted to do a show where we talked a little bit about uh, from the perspective of when loved ones, when family, when friends. Um, Sam, you... You don't have any kids. So far, so good. Uh, you don't have any kids. <laughs> I want kids. Yes, I know you do. And uh, um, I, But you have a lot of spiritual children 
online. You really do. I mean, there's a, you, you have a lot of uh, uh, you're on so many different uh, <laughs> message boards and uh, from the olden <laughs> days. You, you know, you, you're you know, you you moderate a lot of discussions and you're involved in a lot of things. And so you you're more in touch with the uh, we'll just say the digital beast than we are. <laughs> well, and there's also di you know personal relationships with friends and family who are either have left the church or have are very much outside the church and have no interest in, yeah. in coming to mass ever. Well, and the, and they and they speak um, uh, as if it's like they're totally divorced from it and they don't care. Right. Right. They they, they don't really even speak of uh, they see no eternal consequences. They're not moved by it. They don't miss anything. Maybe they're okay every once in a while to make mom and dad happy by going to mass or making their brother or sister or, or, or whatever happy by showing up at, at Easter or uh, Christmas time. Yeah. You know, I, I remember one time seeing somebody who was, we'll just say, very high up in a major corporation. Uh, and I've uh, never seen him at our parish before, but when we were doing midnight mass, uh, on the Christmas midnight mass, Christmas Eve, he comes walking in, you know, and it's like I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't, I mean, he doesn't go to this parish, so if he chose our parish for midnight mass, maybe we were blessed, maybe he regularly goes somewhere, but I just kind of sense that maybe there's some part of him that harkens back to remembering as a kid fond memories of Christmas and going to church and hearing the choir and I don't know those kinds of things and so there's a there's a hunger I think inside people but really when it comes down to believing in God and thinking that this is relevant in their lives most people don't I mean just I'm just I'm gonna say it most people don't think that God is relevant well and then some people are very have very angry towards the church and Christianity in general yeah. um, you have a lot of people and, you know, the church, there are ways in which we need to, uh, there are certain people that we need to work on how we're pastoring and how we're reaching, and that's true. But, you know, at the end of the day, on the opposite side of the fence, you've got people who are preying upon um, wounds that people have to yeah. stir up anger against the church and to, and to make the church look like... Uh, well, I know. The, it's, a, there's, it's a regular uh, cottage industry. I yeah. mean, it really is something, especially online, you, you see that all the time, and you think... I, when I see that stuff, I just have to—I have to turn a blind eye to it. I just have to ignore it because I go, I know all the answers as to that. None of this bothers me because I understand where the the, the fallacies in their yeah. logical argument. And and the thing is, though, uh, I, there there are also people I think that have. Uh, I don't want to. I do not want to delegitimize people's feelings and thoughts and their arguments. But a lot of times, they're straw man arguments. Yeah. Right. I. I the number of times I've heard Sam's like, well, Father so-and-so yelled at me in the confessional, which I want to go, I just don't, I've never heard of a priest yelling at a penitent. Maybe they do. Maybe the priest was having a bad day. Maybe they said something that was perceived that way or whatever. But a lot of times it's like, so you are going to, you're going to leave the church founded by Jesus where the sacraments, where Jesus is physically, spiritually, body, blood, soul, and divinity present to you in Eucharist. You're going to leave that because of some obnoxious priest, right? Well, that's a straw man to me. I look at them and go like, you're, you're just, you're making an argument that yeah. you're kind of, creating a situation that makes it like legitimate that you left really i i don't even know if we have the answers as to why people leave right but they do and i guess the perspective i want to take from this is what what do we do as as parents as brothers as sisters as aunts or uncles as friends uh, co-workers what do we do with with this situation what can we do mm -hmm. right what what are the, th the things that we can uh, be active in doing in trying to help people find their way back, because I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sadness on the part of those who go to church every Sunday and they're sitting there and they're either alone or there's a you know their 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 family is flying the missing man formation right there's mm -hmm. one of their kids just isn't there mm -hmm. because they don't they don't they don't do anymore they're just not you know they had that talk and they finally had enough courage to say to mom or dad I just don't believe this stuff and I think it's a you know, it's it's hip hypocritical for me to go and sit and then not believe, mm -hmm. right? So, what do you do? Uh, maybe we should start with what do you don't do, mm. right? So, uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start there because I think there's a lot of common mistakes we we make. Uh, I have re I've received personally. Uh, I'm holding up my fingers. Uh, there's thousands. I got thousands of fingers 
Uh, mm. Well, people say, like, will you talk to my son? Will you talk to my daughter? Because the way you say it is really good, and, and I want you to explain this uh, biblical passage. I want you to explain this church teaching. I want you to explain it in a way that they will understand it. What you said was like, I'm like, and I'm thinking, you know what's the sad thing is, is sometimes I've blurted it out and I didn't want to blurt it out because I don't want to hurt their feelings or hurt them any more than they're already hurting. But I'll say, no, <laughs> you know, will you talk? No. And they're like, what? It's like, because it's not going to do any good. Now, if they come to me, if, if those kids or, or those people who are like have left come to me, it's like, well, I, I'm happily, happily I will talk to them because they're searching. But you can't search for your child. Yeah. Right. You, you can't you can't give them a pat answer because they don't want that answer. Right. They feel they're being talked at. A hundred percent. Versus talk and, to and, or right, with. Or with and, or having a conversation or someone right. who listens to their that. grief. Right. And the other thing is, like, the person that comes to me and says, will you talk to my kid, that person already believes. And so the arguments that I might say are things they, they wholeheartedly go, yep, 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 he's, he's right. Mm -hmm. But they already believe that. Right. The kid doesn't believe that, right? And so me saying it's not going to make them believe it. Now, sometimes, every once in a while, it'll cause them to have, uh, you know, a little, little uh, uh, you know, chink in the in the armor a little something where they've they've put up this this front that they don't but but i've you know some argument that we'll hear like that a great apologist or a great speaker will say they're like well i never really thought about that and those are seeds that could possibly yield fruit later on but rarely have there ever been conversions based on i i get, i i talked to that that child and all of a sudden, they had a conversion. Mm -hmm. Right. The Holy Spirit has to do this. Yeah. And completely. the kid has to be willing. And you, that, that child or that person, whoever they are with regard to you, they're in your life. And they're going to continue to be a part of your life. And, you know, our faith is an incarnational faith. God desires to enflesh the good news in us. Mm, yeah. And so <clears throat> the more that we focus on growing in our own personal relationship with God, our own openness to God and our willingness, you know, to pray and to fast for that person and to uh, try to grow in virtue and grow uh, in our capacity to witness Christ to others, that can have a huge uh, transformation uh, on the people around us, including those people that are on our hearts and minds, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we create a space uh, around us yeah. that people are welcome or we are welcoming people into that space and if you create a space where they can get to experience the love of God the wisdom of God the knowledge of God and we're you know God never he never said the same thing over and over again he always sp said exactly what that person needed to hear we're not able to do that on our own because we're not God but we have access to God. Yeah, We are created to be vessels. If we focus on setting aside, because sometimes <clears throat> we fallible humans that we are, we can sometimes get our emotions, can get the better better of us, mm -hmm. where we, we may want to, like, you know, get really angry and say, listen here, you're a real jerk for not believing this. That's, you know, that's not going to be helpful at all. That's usually not that nasty. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, Sam, they usually <laughs> say something like, you know, you're going to go to hell if you keep going down this path. <laughs> right, but the, the, the point is, is that, uh, well, some people some people do need to hear the news of hell. I mean, frankly, well, it's a part I, I, of the I know, news. but they're not. But when your kid has decided they don't, right. It's not. Th th that's not going to work. That's not going to be helpful. And so now, Tom's got uh, all of his kids are per are perfectly firmly ensconced oh, no. in the Catholic Church. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I say that jokingly because right. I've got nine kids, which means I've got everything from an axe murderer to a, you know, I've got, oh, yeah. <laughs> you've got all of the all the different folks uh, of, yeah. of there. Especially when you have more kids, there's always going to be some outliers. There's going to be some that aren't following that that path as you'd want them to follow, mm -hmm. as you desire, as much as you love them. I, you know, just affirm me here, but threatening hell. Or eternal no. damnation has never worked, has it? No, it doesn't work. Because well, when they're yeah. when they're not ready to receive that, they're not. It's just going to become a. So you, you know, can see an even bigger barrier. But if they if they engage, because some people, it's like, well, how could a, you say this guy God 
is love, how could a loving God send people to hell? We do need to yeah. be prepared to answer the questions, right? No, no, abs- absolutely you do. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to say that my kids have never said that. Right, right. They, right. They, they, it's, it becomes an emotional thing. They might have heard other people say these things. Sure. And now they've believed. They, they've heard an apostle of Satan, you know, yeah. say these things, and then they just kind of go like, yeah, this makes perfect sense to me. But what I'm getting at ultimately is we are more, ultimately the, the best thing we can be for our for ourselves or others is to be a vessel for God the best we can. And we're going to be broken vessels regardless. We're not perfect. But if we try to be in touch with God at every moment the best we can, and we try to be in touch with what God wants us to say to that person, and we receive that person in Christ, and we love them for God's sake, and we try to do our best to say exactly what we're hearing God move us to say. And sometimes it can be a tough love message. Yeah. You know what I mean? But not always. But the, but the point is, is it's not going to be just one particular moment. God's working within the context of this person's life, every human person's life, every moment matters. And so being in, you don't know what God's doing in that person's life interiorly and around that person when you're not there. So all we can do is do our best to be in touch with what God uh, is moving us to say to right. our best of our discernment, right. and I, then I, let go of the rest. Hundred percent agree with that. I don't. I don't disagree at all. I, I will say, um, tough love doesn't work. I'm mm. just going to say that. I, it's it, personal experiences. Tough love at that point doesn't work until it. I, it's when it comes to them making faith choices, and I'm not arguing with you. But again, this is a, the practical experience of a father of nine and a father of 15. How many? Five. Five. Uh, we have 14 between us. Um, where it's like you might, you know, you use tough love when they're little, right? And you're teaching them lessons, and they, but they're receptive at that point. Yeah. Once they become 18, once they become like in their own minds separated from you uh, and, and you're not responsible for the way that they think, Tough love will do nothing for them, right? right. It, 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 I, my experience is that way. Now, there may be, I'm sure there are situations where when you're further down along a conversation, you, you know, and and they have willingly engaged in a conversation. Yeah. Because what I find is they aren't willingly engaging in a conversation because in their mind, they've already made up their minds. Right. Right. They're, are, they're already done. The, the, the argument is settled. And I am some kind of antiquated fool that, that drank the Kool-Aid a long time ago and that I really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and and that's that's if I understand that perspective as I'm going into this, then I, my options have to change. Yeah. Right. They don't really want to have a long reasoned conversation. You hope and pray that they will. But what I really liked what you said, Sam, and what is a hundred percent true, and I've said it on the show before, and I've told other people this, but before I ever talk to anyone, before I do this show, I will pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to be present. And that the words that I use will be the, the words of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can't guarantee that I don't get in the way at times because I am human. You said that we're broken and we're fallible and we make mistakes. And our human emotions can sometimes get the better of us. But the reality is, if I'm doing my best always to ask for the Holy Spirit to be present. Now, you don't do it when you're getting ready to talk to your kid. Right, you, you don't stop and go, Lord, send your angels upon me that I may strike with lightning bolts in the soul of my, my child's dead heart. You know? And you say that out loud, that's probably not going to go well for the conversation that's getting ready to happen. But if you silently just say three words, come Holy Spirit, you just yeah. say that and you welcome the Spirit, I, I promise you the Spirit will be present. I do that before I preach, before I teach, before I counsel or talk. And the thing is, at the end of the day, um, I think... As you've stated, it's a journey that we have to recognize things. They're not going to be, um, you know, spur of the moment conversions in in a in a kid that's like just kind of coming of age and coming into themselves, and they're basically rebelled. They've made a decision already, and so you have to get them back to listen again. Yeah. Right. So other things not to do: nagging. Right. The, the constant like, uh, did you go to mass? Did you go to mass? Did you go to mass? They're, this, it's going to be the same answer. In fact, you're going to push them away, I think, further, right? And, and, and then there's also the thing I mentioned before, but 
asking like them, to, oh, you need to talk to Deacon Jeff, or you need to talk to a priest, or you need to talk to so and so, you know, uh, Tom the theologian. You need you need to talk to this person, and that needs to be this conversation. What also does I, it, it doesn't work because they're like going, you're just trying to brainwash me or something. You're right. you're you're to them it's akin to waterboarding. You know, it's like yeah. they're they're going to drown in the words that are just like right. spewed upon them, and they don't want to hear hear any of that stuff. And, um, and and then of course the the other thing that you don't want to do um, is like to, to lay the little Bible tracks on the pillow, you know, to right. to, to to leave a uh, accidentally leave a CD in the CD player. That's an old school talk. You people don't even know what a CD player is. Most people listening now. But the thing is, like programs and things. If you just sit through this twelve part series, you know, then you are going to suddenly come back to the church. It's like, I promise you, they're not going to sit for the first part of the first episode of the 12-part series because they don't want that, right? So that, that leaves us like in a, in a place where it's like, uh, okay, so wh- wh- what, are we, what are we supposed to do? Well, I mean, because there's, like, there's nowhere to go. I think what you do is you treat your children as adults. You know, most adults, you don't nag them. You don't you know tracks in front of them you don't put cds in front of them any of that kind of stuff you recognize your autonomy you respect them yeah and then also just be yourself don't don't get in their faces just love them love them where they are and then let the holy spirit work yeah that's 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 the holy spirit i think that i think that works and that'll work for family or friends right right that be yourself thing it's kind of like the curcio mantra you know, make a friend, be, be a, a friend, friend. That middle part, and then bring a friend to Christ. Yeah, they're so not going to come unless make they, a friend and yeah. be a friend. Yeah, because what I think what you end up having to do ultimately, I'm, I'm going to give you the answer, and we have still got five minutes left in the program. <laughs> the biggest, the biggest answer to me, what always I think works the most, is uh, is you you gain their trust. Right. They have to believe that you are not trying to convert them. That you're not trying to. Uh, like uh, brainwash them. That they're not a project. Yeah. That, exactly. They have to believe that they're not a project, that they're not like some kind of feather that you're going to then go off and brag and say, well, you know, my, my child was going straight to hell, but you know what? I said these, these words and they came back. Yeah. You know, I, you know I, that I've, I've canceled a multitude of my own sins. You know? right, right. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's, that's scriptural, but at the same time, you're also with your pride you're you're now committing other sins yeah. you know but really you have to regain their trust I and mean, you you somehow lost it right that, uh, and it's not so much that they don't trust you it's that they they don't need to be like guided by you what we need to be like is the, is the prodigal son's father run out to meet them yeah when you see them be be looking for them and when yeah. you see them then go love them go to that's them that's right and then embrace them. Don't. Although I will say that I've seen like some people like overreact when that kid comes to church and they're sitting there nervously like I didn't really want to do this, but I've done it like I am so glad you're here. It's so good to see you sitting right here. And isn't this nice? This right. is wonderful. You know, you can go overboard with that, but right. the, the the genuineness of the the the, the, the prodigal father, the prodigal son's father, that genuineness of that he ran out to meet him. Yeah. That that right there speaks volumes, right? I, you know, so. Uh, well, the other thing too that speaks volumes to me is that he let him go. You know, sometimes you yeah, just have to let go. Well, that's the respect that you said right. on the front part. Right, right. It's like, hey, you're an adult now. Yeah, you're making your own decisions. Yeah, I'm praying for you. Now go. there's also a, there's also consequences. You know that, right? But I love you, and right. I hope this works out for you. Yeah. You know, one other thing that comes to mind because there right now there is a movement where a lot of young people are going to more traditional liturgy, traditional Latin Mass, it, Eastern Rite, tr- more traditional uh, Novus Ordo, like where it's presented at Orientum, facing the uh, priest facing the East, things like that. If you're there's a lot of young people right now who it, you know, if you, especially if there's a, is a parish that the music might be a little cheesy where it's kind of like 1970s kind yeah. of pop type music. You might want to ask yourself, is there some liturgy, like a timeless liturgy in my area that I could explore and drive to? And is it moving my heart with beauty if I find one? And if I see a, t- a beautiful timelessness in a liturgy that my child's never been exposed to, that could be an opportunity to, if you fall in love with that, uh, beauty, you know, you know, Bishop Aaron says, lead with beauty. In the beauty, they'll see goodness. In the goodness, they'll see truth. 
explore to see is have I exposed my child to the most beautiful liturgy that I can. And if you haven't and you find something truly beautiful that moves your heart and especially something that's truly timeless, you could maybe shoot your shot to be like, hey, I would like you to experience something with me. It's changed my life. We'll go to breakfast yeah. afterwards. Worst that case scenario that your, your kid can say no. But if they are exposed to a side of the mass that they've never seen before, that invitation can go a long way. It had a big impact on Tom. It's had yeah. a big impact on me. And So, yeah, I, I don't doubt that at all. It's, it's beautiful. And so as long as the... The kids don't feel like they're going somewhere and you're going to try to pull a fast one on them, right? <laughs> uh, and you can always talk about the per from the perspective of you, what, what you like, what you love, and what happened to you. Uh, just don't put it on them and mm -hmm. say that you should feel this way, you should do this, because that's not going to work either. Right. So there's, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but the, the, the reality is I, I think we can go back to that, that old um, uh, understanding, like when you get on an airplane and you go through the little safety protocol, and it always tells you to put your mask on first before you That's put right. on. Mm -hmm. So you need to take care of yourself. You need to stay close to the sacraments. You need to stay close to God uh, in prayer. Like th you cannot give what you do not have. And, th and they're going to see falseness if, if you don't really live that way, but you're talking about living that way. And so it's important that you do that. And then also there's something beautiful about the concept of offering it up, right? What we can do, a lot of people don't realize that the mass is offered for people, but there's a there's a phrase in the first Eucharistic prayer that says, uh, and it's it's the the commemoration of a living. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them, we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. You can make an offering when you go to mass. Offer it for your kids. Offer it up, as the nuns used to say. And there's there's something divinely beautiful supernaturally powerful about grace and how it works in a family. So invite the Holy Spirit in, get your kids to trust you, uh, and just love them. Be yourself, love them. Realize this is all a journey. You don't look for instant results. We'd all love to be able to brag at our like bridge game how our kids came back to the church. That's not necessarily going to happen until anybody, somebody's deathbed. The reality is it takes time. And just know that God loves them, God loves you, and wants everyone to live a life filled with joy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the, the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. to the Catholic Cafe. If you'd like to contact Deacon Jeff, send him an email at deaconjeff at thecatholiccafe.com. Visit us on the web at thecatholiccafe.com. You can also find us on iTunes or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The Catholic Cafe is brought to you by the Order of Malta Federal Association. Join us again at the Catholic Cafe, serving up salvation one cup of coffee at a time.